Frank, in your 40 years as a promoter, there have been some wild times, some highs, some lows. But that arrival of Mike Tyson in January of 2000 must be one of the wildest and weirdest times you've ever had as a promoter. Yeah, they were pretty exciting times and strange times. And, well, I think it every, ticks every box of every, every emotion and so forth that you can think of. Uh, you know, he was dealing... He actually was good when he landed the first time. He was in... He was, he was uh, good fun. He was in a good place. Seemed OK. Wanted to fight. Well received. And uh, the first show went really well. The, the arrival, he was greeted well. Well, that's an understatement. That day, that afternoon at the airport, well, it was chaotic. It was brilliant. It was, it was a taster of what was going to come for the next 28 days. Well, we actually wanted to take him out the back because we knew there'd be chaos, but the police refused to do that. Said he's got to be treated like any other person and come through the front, which is quite ironic because the second time he came over, they insisted he went out the back and weren't allowed through the front. <laughs> But what, what I remember most about that day was just that there just seemed to be people coming from nowhere. Like there were, there were already people there to see him. There were some people there to see him. And then word seemed to spread for every single terminal. And it just, they were coming in in hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. I thought at one point that we were going to struggle to get out, get away from the airport in the car. Well, we did, didn't we? And we, we you know, we, we got him through and that. And he was, you know, he was quite taken aback with the uh, welcome that he was getting. Because, you know, let's get it right in the States. He wasn't well liked after some of the things that he'd done. He had a lot of problems there. But he had a, you know, it's the first time he'd ever fought in, was about the fight in Britain. I mean, we, when we announced the show, we put it on, we put it on sale without even announcing an opponent and sold out in 10 minutes. I mean, the truth of the matter is not to ticket touts, not to stub hubs and all that stuff. We sold it straight out to genuine fans, and the uh, and the uh, MEN up in uh, Manchester set all uh, you know, officially set the fastest the fastest selling event they've ever had there. So it no. sold out very quickly without naming the opponent. I wanted to put it on though. I wanted yeah. to put it on in Cardiff, but Shelley Finkel, who looked after him, they didn't want to go there. They said it's too big, and what happens if it's half full? I said it won't be half full. I said I'll, I'll fill it. I'll make sure I fill it. You think you could have done ninety odd? You, you, could, you think you could have done ninety odd thousand down in Cardiff? Well, standing on our head, we sold it. I out. agree. I mean, and that was without announcing the opponent, and without all the publicity that came afterwards, when all the politicians were jumping on the bandwagon saying he shouldn't be allowed in the country. None of that was happening. It was front page news for about you know two, three weeks. Every day there was some you know someone coming out saying he shouldn't be allowed to box here. They were probably I know. right. I I, I was in the absolute thick of it, remember, with the film. Now, Frank, let, let me remind you, if, he, if Tyson was shocked and impressed with what he got at the airport, that trip to Brixton, when we had to take sanctuary, irony of ironies, inside a police station to yeah. get away from about 10,000 people. Well, if you remember, I mean, you, you, we went there and it was just the whole of Brixton come out and they said it was the biggest, uh, it, it, it was bigger than when Nelson Mandela went there. People weren't going away. They weren't going. They was going crazy outside. And eventually, we had to go out. We went. We got out of the station in a couple of, uh, I think, you know, a couple of the coppers' cars. We had to lay down on the back seats. I and, remember, and yeah. Drive us out. yeah. And so, and, and, and then we came along and picked you up, picked you up down the road in Kennington, Frank. But what about one of the things that sticks in my mind? Uh, were his shopping sprees. Now, whether it was shopping for McLaren cars, whether it was shopping for diamonds, or whether it was shopping for underpants, silk underpants, he loved to go shopping, and you seemed to be his number one. You were like his personal shopper in the back of the car. Well, what happened? He wanted, he, you know, the, the, the McLaren situation happened um, the, the night he got there. It was in Park Lane. <laughs> he wanted to go, he was looking in the window as a Sunday. And he wanted to go in there. I said, they're shut. And he, first thing in the morning, he was in there and he's trying to buy a car. Thankfully, back then, <laughs> uh, they hadn't passed their emissions and you know, all the tests they had to have to take him into the States. It was a million pound car. Anyway, he didn't get he, he the car. But he was like a big kid. He was so petulant. So then, let's go to Bond Street. We went to Bond Street. As you know, we went in a few clothes shops, which I, you know, I had no problem. I picked up those yeah. bills. And then he, he sort of, he kept saying he wanted to go to Graf, the jeweler. So we went there. And next minute, he's picking out all this jewellery. They're showing him jewellery. And he run up a bill for about two million. I can't remember what the exact <laughs> amount was, but that two million quid. I'd done a deal for on his behalf to get the get it knocked down. We got some quite a bit of money off of them. But it weren't about the jewellery. It was about some girl who was working in the shop who he'd met in the Unbelievable. hotel. Unbelievable. 
night before or something. Uh, that was lucky, Blonde, wasn't it? Young, young blonde girl in there next week. And, he said, and all he kept saying, give her the commission. That's all it's about. It's all about being... Jury met, it wasn't about jury. It was about showing off to the girl. So he gets all the jury. And that was that. Was that. I rang Jay. I said, listen, he's in a jeweler's shop. I, said, this is, I told him what the bill he went. And he just said, don't worry. They'll settle it. They'll take it off the purse and pay the bill. And Graphs just gave him an invoice and said, you can take it out of the shop. And that was it. And I've bought diamonds all over the world. And I'm truly impressed here. I must say one thing. Mike's got a great knowledge of diamonds. He's not just uh, a boxing man. He's a man that seems to have studied diamonds, in my opinion, because each rare stone I've shown him, he's known about. I know a little bit about everything. I don't know a lot about anything. Yeah, but you know quite a bit about diamonds, Mike. That's for sure. Yeah. That's the most beautiful watch in the world. Graph watch, y'all. Lawrence Graph, y'all. That's right. It's a million dollar watch. You don't Do you get any discount, Mike? Huh? No. Not much of a discount here in England. That's not true. I, I got him an excellent discount. Problem is, he never paid. <laughs> the, ju the jeweler wasn't too keen on sharing the discount. Yeah, it did turn ugly after that a little bit, didn't it? Well, not after that. It was the night. Of the, 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 it was the, the night before the fight, before he's fighting Julius Francis. Um, Shelley came into the ring and into the, knocked on my door and said, "Look, Mike's giving your jury back, and he's going going home." And I said, "What wow. do you mean going home?" He said, "He's at the airport," which he was. He was at the airport. He went to the airport. I said, "Well." You know, that was like a blag to get me to pay for it. I just said to him, well, I said, well, not a problem with me. I said, you, you know, going home, he's going home. I said, one thing's for sure. I'm not, I'm going to pay him a million and a half quid for your, for jewelry. Are you off your head or something? And that was it. Anyway, um, for some reason, he came back. And for some reason, he didn't leave the jury in the room. <laughs> <laughs> and he went ahead and he went ahead with the fight. But then Frank, of course, he came back a few months later, six months later, and he's a different Tyson. The Tyson in January was, was passive, he was friendly, he was lovely, he was engaging, the fans loved him, he loved the fans. I mean, no one had a bad word to say against him, apart from a couple of politicians. But the man that arrived back in, in the summer was a different beast. But this time we met him at the airport, the police made him go out the back door. He was very unhappy about that. He wanted to go through the front door. Whereas mm. before, he wanted to go out the back door. You know, it's all this nonsense. <laughs> Got in the car, and when I got in the car with him, he was just a totally different person. He was sitting in the back of my my, my car, and I was sitting there with him, and he was like he was like he was in the corner of the car, and he was like a he looked like he was gonna you know he looked like a cornered animal. His eyes were all you know waiting to lash out at somebody. You know, we went to the hotel. He was went up to the room. Uh, I think it's the next day or the day after. I'll get a phone call and uh, send uh, what I. Go up to the room. He's, he's not. Uh, he's, you know, I think Shelley rang me or somebody rang me and said, "Go up to. He needs to. You know, he wants to see you." And I went up there and it's all over the, you know, the jury. Why has this not been paid? I don't think they told him. You know, because remember, I never spoke to him direct about the jury. I, I think they. Yeah, it's like everybody tells you what he wants to hear. And cut a long story short, a bit of an argument. Already Lawrence Graff wanted to be paid. He was very patient. He waited nearly what you said it was six months. And all the properties, the money was being going to be sent. Constantly, Showtime told me that, that the money would be settled. Then it was to be settled from the second fight. But it wasn't. It didn't happen. And then he, he issued proceedings. But I think without the proceedings, what happened? I think they fired the girl in the shop. Ouch! Well, they did fire the girl in the shop, and he's gone in the shop. She's not there, and that was that was it. And so him and I had a, had a little altercation, and that was it. It got a bit physical, and then. Uh, that was that. All this stuff about I had a broken jaw, broken ribs, and God knows what, just total and I was at the show. What was the show about? Four days later, where it was? Yeah, five, five or six, a week, a week later. No, I mean, it wasn't even a week. He wasn't in, the, he wasn't even in, in, in London for, oh, sorry, he wasn't even in for a week. And, um, you know, it, it, that just didn't happen. And if you look, I purposely, I remember getting into the ring, I was, I, I, Bent to get into, you know, got through the ropes. You can't do that. Yeah. You had a broken ribs. I certainly didn't have a broken jaw because I made, I remember having bubble gum and blowing bubbles. And he went, you know, he, there was all sorts of quite, quite interesting what happened behind the scenes. But there was a lot of, um, <laughs> it was quite an interesting <laughs> moment. But even right up to the time he fought, him and I were at it. And I made him, I, you know, and I made him pay for what he did. And that was it. And made him pay for the jury, by the way.
Frank, listen, it's been a delight and a pleasure going through that, that part of 2000 with you. But I, I, I must admit, I want to end with just that, that moment, that, that, that little bit, that great scene when Tyson comes out in front of 20-odd thousand at the MEN. I've got to tell you, that was, a, that was a special moment. And even in your 40 years, that was a special moment. You know, we tried to go for a ring entrance and he wouldn't do it. He said, I don't want no music. I just want to walk in. You know, he, he was you know, pretty much against it. And, you know, he never wears a dressing gown. Just, of course, of course. It's such a, you know, he's, he's, I mean, he's got such a, um, he's it's just menace, isn't he? He's just what he yeah. is. He's like raw, raw aggression, menace when you look at him and the way he is. And uh, he had a guy around him at the time who was, a lot of people didn't like. I liked him, Crocodile. Crocodile, Steve you know, Fitz. He was a cheerleader. You remember yeah. him? Great yeah, guy, Steve. great guy. I liked him. I really got yeah, him. Me too. And I said, Steve. And I discussed the entrance and I said, this is what we're going to do. So we put up these big, if you remember, two big like doors. They would look like, like safe doors or a fortress doors. Yeah. We'd done all the sirens and then bang, he kicked the, the crocodile. I said, well, you've got to kick the doors open. But it looked like Mike kicked him, like Mike Tyson. Right? And through they come, the place just went crazy. Absolutely crazy. Yeah. Good atmosphere, great atmosphere. Yeah, Good it fun. really was. That was a Frank fun day. That, yeah, listen, that was a fair been plenty of those. Don't worry about that. Listen, Frank, thanks so much for your time to looking back on that night, that film, and Mike Tyson in 2000.